here we are. We're going to tie Garrison Doctor's little pattern called a sweet meat caddis. This is a, uh, a jigged caddis pupa nymph. I'll give you a little, little peek at the finished product. Um, that is a pretty cool little fly and uh, one of the best things about it is it's a pretty simple pattern. So we're going to twist one of these up. I'm going to walk you through it and uh, I think you should tie some up as well. Uh, so I've got a, a three millimeter slotted bead um, tungsten slotted bead. This one's gold and this is on a size 14 Hannock 450 BL uh, which is this wide gap uh, kind of turned in point uh, jig hook and uh, really a pretty cool hook with that big wide gap but uh, I'm going to slide that that slotted bead up here onto the upright and then I've got some my spool of thread doesn't have a label on it anymore, but this is 6 aught Danville in just brown. Um, you know, the exact color of your thread is not going to make a huge difference here. Um, it's barely going to show, but I'm going to start this thread just up behind that bead, and you can see I'll hold on to the tag end and build a little thread dam to wedge that bead up against the upright on the hook, and then I'll cut my tag end out. And the first thing I'll do is I'm going to try to make a nice, smooth, even thread base going back to the bend here. And then I'll come forward again. And again, I want to try to keep this underbody smooth. Uh, this is a wire-bodied fly. So any wire-bodied fly from a brassy to a copper john to, uh, to this fly, you want to have as smooth an underbody as you can get. And that'll just make uh, making the wraps for the finished fly body that much easier. So the body on this, um, the one I'm going to tie here is, is golden olive UTC wire in small. So I've got a length of this wire. I'm going to straighten it out. And of course you can tie it in different colors. Garrison ties it in uh, ginger and uh, this golden olive color. But uh, I've tied some in chartreuse and tan. Um, wire comes in a ton of colors. You can even go just to tractor colors as well. But, um, you know, so, so use what you've got. But I'm going to take this piece of wire and I'm going to lay it in. I'll kind of show you a little trick here. You can see we've got our, our hook shank going horizontal and our thread coming up uh, vertical. I'm going to lay this wire in. Um, sort of at an angle across the thread. So I'm coming from the thread across the bottom of the hook to catch it. And I'll just get a few turns on it. And then I'm going to draw that down. Try not to pull it out. Oh, like that. I know you wanted to see that again. A few turns on it. I'll take that tag end around my near side. I'm going to draw that down to length. And one of my issues that I'm having here is my background for the camera is a little sketchy, but um, it's also that I'm old and I can't see as good as I used to. So I'm going to wrap back over that piece of wire and I've got it tied in along my near side of the hook. And I want to come all the way back to the end of that thread base and then forward again. Um, now I tie left handed so my thread doesn't twist much as I, uh, as I wrap it. But if I wrap, make enough wraps in a row it will start, start to twist. So I want to occasionally stop and unwind it. But I want to build a bit of a taper here. You can see I'll just work back and forth. building a, a nice smooth taper. Um, now matching matching Garrison's pattern, um, this is a conventional taper, you know, skinnier at the back and fatter at the front. Um, it's occurred to me that a caddis pupa is a little fatter at the back and skinnier at the front. So I've tied a few of them with that reverse taper as well, and those look cool. Um, I'm not sure that it makes any difference, just, you know, that's just me being, being me. Um, so once I've got that thread base built, I'm going to start to wrap this wire from the bend forward and I want to make these wraps as tight um, and butted together as I can. And one of the tricks to doing this, as you can see, as I come over the hook, my wire is tilted toward the rear. And that allows the previous turn to act as a guide for the next turn and really butts those together tightly. Um, I make the majority of the turn with my material hand here at the back of the vise and just use my, my thread hand here at the front to, to hand it off. I'll tie that wire off with a few turns and then just helicopter the end to break it off. Now we're going to put in a little bit of a collar and this is going to be um, ice dub in UV brown. And I'm just going to take a tiny little pinch. I, I even kind of tear it off there a little bit. Not too much there. And I'm just going to make a little ball of this dubbing. I'm going to dub it down very tightly on my thread but I don't need much of it. It's easy to overdo. And this is a fairly coarse dubbing, so it's not going to go on, uh, it's not going to go on super tight regardless. 
And I'm just going to make a little ball there, like so. It actually just occurred to me that if I look at this fly on the monitor, I can see it better than I can with my eyeball because of my background here. But um, So now as we get toward the wing on this fly, um, what we're going to do is we're going to take two, two CDC feathers, and I want to pick out two nice ones here. These two will do just fine. Let's see, let's do, let's do these two. Um, and it really sort of depends on the density of your CDC feather. Um, these are a little sparse, but there's two of them. And what I want to do is just stack them on top of each other. And then I'm going to create a separation point. And by that I mean, I'm just going to kind of draw some of the fibers down on both sides of the stem, just treating it as one unit. And I'm going to come in and cut the center stem out there so that I'm just left with a V. And I want to clump that V up into a bundle. And you can see it kind of comes out ragged. You can kind of square it up a little bit. Um, it comes out a little bit ragged, which is the whole idea. We don't want it perfectly square cut. So I'm going to take this clump of CDC and we want to tie this in sort of like a beard, but really more like a, but almost like a comparadun wing across the bottom of the hook. Um, what I don't want to do is just end up with a, a straight little kind of bonefish fly wing looking kind of thing. But I want to measure this just about the length of the hook. I'm going to set it in along my far side and hold it in place. And then I'm going to use my thread to pull it to the bottom. You see how I can let that rotate down? And I can even manually distribute that across the bottom half of the hook so that we've got that little fan look. I'm going to pull that CDC down, those butt ends, and trim those off just as close as I can get them. Um, you can see how I expertly hold my thread out of the way so I don't cut it. Um, I don't always do that, but I felt like that was a good idea today. I'll sweep that back and then just bury those butts under a few turns of thread. And you can see that we've got that across the bottom half of the hook. Um, and you could even uh, use your thread, you know, if you've got a bald spot, I don't know that I do necessarily, but let's. You can see how I can push that thread wrap back a bit and distribute that even more. So we've got a nice even spread across the bottom half of the hook. But the top um, is still going to remain clear. And the idea on that, that's from Garrison. He likes that bottom. You know, this hook obviously is going to drift upside down. Um, so he wants the bottom exposed so the fish get a good solid view of that. Now we're going to put in a couple of antenna. And for the antenna we're just going to use mallard flank. And I'm going to take four fibers. Um, I imagine six would work fine too, um, but I want four nice fibers here. Let's see if I can get a hold of four. I think I've got that four there. I might actually have six, but at any rate, it doesn't make a big difference. Um, just you can see little, little small clump there. Definitely see three there on the monitor on one side. We're going to go with that. Um, and I'm going to lay these in along the sides of the hook. I'm going to push them back so they're just a little bit longer than the hook. And then I'm going to turn them just slightly toward me. So you can see I'll tilt my hand toward me uh, so that my far side's a little high and my near side's a little low. And I'll hold those in place and take my thread over them. And that should let the thread roll them into place where they're along either side of the hook. Now I can separate those butts. You can see that far side's a little high. You can see I can just pull up on that, kind of tweak that into position. Same thing here on my near side. Get those anchored down with a couple more turns. Um, and any place I've got these long butt ends that stick out when I'm tying, especially mallard flake, it's such a tapered, fine, thin feather. Um, I'll fold that back and catch it with the turn. I'll do that on both sides. That just helps to anchor those in place. And then I'll trim those out. Just the tips of my scissors there. And then our last step is we're going to take just a little pinch of peacock eye stub. Eye stub peacock. Um, and you could use peacock black. You could use any variety of darker colors. Um, you could even use that same UV brown dubbing. Um, and I'm going to take a little clump of this and I'm going to dub this on. And this you can overdo just a little bit. We're going to pick this out all said and done on the finished product. So I, when I pick the dubbing out, um, I always want to apply it just a little bit heavier. Um, we're going to go in with a piece of Velcro and just sort of shag this up. Um, and if we put on exactly the right amount and then pick some out, we won't have enough. 
Um, so I want to use a bit more than you think is necessary. I'll build that up a bit. And then as I run out of dubbing right up behind the bead, I'll come in and whip finish there. And you can see that dubbing goes on pretty shaggy. That was on purpose. We'll trim that thread out. And then I'm going to hunt up my piece of Velcro here. And this is just the hook side of a strip of Velcro. I'm going to take this and use it to sweep that dubbing back and sort of pick it out and create a veil around the head of the fly. I've got my near side looking real good. And you can see how a lot of that dubbing will come out. That's, that's why we, uh, we overdubbed it, obviously. This little strip you can kind of use to, to shoe shine in the gap of the hook a bit to, to get that extra dubbing loose. Get that loosened up, and you can see how buggy that fly comes out. That's uh, a really good looking, good looking collar on that. Got a couple of trap fibers here. Um, of course, you, you could use a bodkin or a dubbing brush for that, but that Velcro seems to work really well for it. But just a nice little nondescript, simple little pattern. That's one of the coolest things about this fly. It's uh, super easy to tie. You know, just in in sort of warming up for the article in. Uh, uh, this video I've tied, I don't know, a couple dozen of them maybe, but um, they sure go by fast and you can perfect it pretty quickly. But, um, you know, obviously a great summertime uh, caddis hatch pattern. But uh, one of the things that Garrison and I talked about in, a, in the inter <coughs> excuse me, interview that I did with him um, is that he fishes this sort of as an attractor, you know, all summer long. And, uh, you know, when he said that, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, I fished a variety of different caddis pupa patterns um, in that same way over the years. And I, I think what it, what it stems from, the reason they work so well, is uh, caddis hatch so often during the summer that the fish are very used to seeing a caddis pupa. It's not just during caddis hatches. Um, I think there's some kind of flitting around at any, any given time. So it's something that they're pretty used to seeing and that they, uh, um, you know, recognize as a food source fairly quickly. But um, that's... Uh, a, a good way to think of this. Don't think of it. Don't just pigeonhole it into into one little box where you're only going to fish it during uh, during caddis hatch periods. This is a uh, a good attractor uh, kind of general bug all summer long. And that is Garrison's sweet meat caddis. Uh, again, super simple, um, deadly effective. Um, these jig nymphs are. Uh, are coming on strong with good reason. They don't snag up uh, on the bottom near as much as conventional hooks. Uh, they tend to hook fish right square in the in the snout, uh, which is a really good spot to hook them. Uh, less damage to the fish and very easy to steer them around, and they tend not to come out. Um, and they just sink like a bomb. That uh, that configuration of the the bead being the low point uh, really lets these flies sink and stay down where they need to. So. Um, I like this on a dry dropper rig. Um, Garrison likes it on a, uh, a sort of Euro rig with uh, uh, other droppers up the leader or even just as a single. Um, but you, you really can't go wrong even under an indicator. This file will do the job, no doubt about it. Just tie it onto a tag and uh, fish it that way. But um, dry dropper is my, probably my favorite way to do this under a... Uh, uh, you know, either a, a fairly large bushy caddis dry or a small, small chubby or a fat Angie. Um, but that's... Uh, that's the bug, the sweet meat caddis from Garrison Doctor of Rep Your Water. Um, if you haven't checked out his site, please do. It's repyourwater.com. Uh, he's got some some incredible artwork, just an amazingly talented artist, and uh, I think you'll really enjoy that too, and it makes sense when you see his bugs uh, where that artistic ability comes from. So uh, I hope you enjoyed watching. Thanks for uh, tuning in, and there's always more coming. I'm Charlie Craven. Take care.